The Oracle Network. My name is Dr. Stacy Hughes, and I host Oklahoma Side Slayings in the Sooner State. Have you ever heard the term going postal? Have you ever heard of Machine Gun Kelly? Not the singer, the outlaw. Did you know both Going Postal and Machine Gun Kelly originated in Oklahoma? Have you heard of the unbelievable true crime cases involving serial killer Roger Dell Stafford, or perhaps the cannibalistic plot against a young girl named Jamie Boleyn? Or maybe you've heard of the unspeakable unsolved murder of Karina Saunders. These are just some of the incredible cases that I explore in Oklahoma Side, a true crime podcast that delves into the murderous acts of Oklahomans across the Sooner State. Don't miss new episodes every Wednesday on Spreaker, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, or wherever you listen to your podcast. Remember, if you don't know them, you don't owe them. Stay safe and protect yourself. Hey, 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 Rainbow Warriors. This is my disclaimer. Beyond the Rainbow is a true crime podcast. It's not suitable for young children, and maybe not even for some adults. I tend to swear like a sailor, and I'm kind of proud of that. Listener discretion is advised. Hey there, Rainbow Warriors. Welcome to Beyond the Rainbow. True Crimes of the LGBTQ+. I'm your host, CJ. I just want to say I had the best time the other day. I recorded with my buddies over at our True Crime podcast. They invited me to go tell them an LGBTQ plus true crime story. And I did. I hope you'll all go check it out. It's a case I've not covered on here before. That's our True Crime podcast. And the following day, I recorded with my friend Mike and my other friend JT over on Brew Crime. Mike also invited me to tell him and JT a true crime LGBTQ plus story. This one's from Canada, and again, not one I've covered before. So I hope you'll check out both our true crime podcast and Brew Crime for more content from me. I'm on the socials. Facebook and Instagram at Beyond the Rainbow, and Twitter, TikTok, and Tumblr at Rainbow Crimes. And please take a look at my website where you can find a list of all of my past cases. And should you be able to help support the show, there's a link to my Tee Public merch store with some cute t-shirt and mug designs. By the way, they make the perfect gift for someone special in your life. And there's also a link to my Buy Me a Coffee account. And that's for an easy one-time donation. Also on my Buy Me a Coffee account, I've been trying to write up some short true crime stories. And I post them on there. I use it as kind of a blog. And if you go take a look at my website, you'll find a list of missing but not forgotten LGBTQ plus people. This episode's missing person is 65-year-old Carl Brines from Palm Springs, California. He was last seen May 2nd, 2020. Carl is a big bear. He stands at 6 feet tall and weighs about 275 pounds. He has white hair and a close-cropped, whitish-gray beard. He has a tad of a scorpion on the left side of his chest, a dragon on his right bicep, and a rainbow on his back. Carl left behind his cell phone, wallet, and other personal items. He left on foot from the 300 block of East Via Escuela Road. Carl's husband says that Carl suffers from PTSD, borderline personality disorder, and severe depression. He'd been off his meds for over a week when he disappeared. And really, that's all that's out there about Carl's disappearance. Other than Carl was probably dressed in drawstring gray gym shorts, and a light-colored v-neck t-shirt. Should anyone have any information about Carl Brine's disappearance, please call Palm Springs Police at 760-323-8116. You know, the more true crime cases I research, 
the more amazed I get at how shitty of life partners there are out there in this world. People who fall in love with someone treat them like royalty until they get them, and then they go and flip a 180 and become a horrible person to the person that they claim they love. If that's love, no thank you. There has to be boundaries and mutual respect in relationships of all kinds. Coercive control is a popular trick of people with a narcissistic type personality. There's 12 signs of someone who's controlling. The victim, however, doesn't always know what to look for. Quickly, let's take a look at these signs. Number one, isolation. This would include moving you away from loved ones so it's hard for you to visit them and convincing you that your family doesn't really love you. Number two, monitoring. The controller wants to know where you're at and who you're with at all times. They also monitor your phone calls. Number three, you're denied freedom and autonomy. You're only allowed to go certain places agreed upon by the controller. Your vehicle use is limited and you might be followed by the controller. Number four, gaslighting. The controller must always be right. To do so, they'll manipulate and lie to convince you you're wrong and possibly even crazy. Number five, name-calling and put-downs. I don't think I need to elaborate on this one much. I was once told in one of my long-term relationships I couldn't possibly be the one to give birth to our baby. I mean, look at me. This forever stung and it's something I will always remember. That and I would never find anyone else to love me. It's just a malicious way to get the victim to lose all self-esteem. Number six, limiting access to money. It doesn't matter if the victim is the breadwinner or the controller is the breadwinner. The controller seizes all control of all the money and the victim will see very little, if any, of it. Number seven. Reinforcing Traditional Gender Roles CJ, that doesn't sound like it belongs in an LGBTQ plus relationship. Well, warriors, you might be wrong on that. I mean, look at it like this. You have two lesbians. One takes on the more butch role, and the other takes on the femme role. Or maybe you have two gay guys, and they do the same thing. One is more butch, and one is more femme. Those types of relationships can easily fall into the traditional gender roles. It can also happen with bi people and trans people, but mostly it is geared towards straight couples. I just want everyone to remember it can be considered an alternative lifestyle living as well. Number eight, turning kids against the victim. Obviously, that only works if the couple has children. Number nine, Controlling aspects of your health and body. You might only be allowed to sleep a certain amount of time. Eat only certain things at certain times. You might have to exercise when the controller says to. And even medications can become an object of control. Number 10. Making jealous accusations. These accusations can be the most absurd ones of all. Like the controller can fly off the handle and ask you, why'd you look at the person in line at the grocery store the way you did? Were you flirting with them? Why did you spend so much time today with your sister? Who were you really with? Number 11, regulating your sexual relationship. The controller says when and where. The controller might even only want the acts performed on them with no pleasure for you. Videos and pictures of the session might even be demanded. Number 12. Threatening your children or pets. When the controller feels like they're losing control, this is their desperation attempt to get their control back. They might even threaten to kill the object of your love or to harm them in some way. Should any of these things be happening to you or someone you love, the steps to get out of this are important to take right this very second. Make a plan for a safe escape. Practice the plan when you can and as often as you can. If you can possibly reach out for a support line, they can help you. 
even if it's a friend, a family member, someone on a social media site that you've befriended. Call someone if you can. The best? Call a domestic abuse hotline and call them often. If you have kids involved, teach them where a safe place is, like the neighbors, a library, a friend's house, and be sure to teach them your area's emergency services phone number, like here in America, it's 911. And if you ever find yourself in danger, call that emergency services number. If you are brave enough to leave, never turn back to the controller. Even if you're scared, don't do it, or the cycle will never end. I speak of the coercive controller because this episode's case is about one. The controller didn't have all 12 of the controlling signs, but he sure had enough of them. Craig Kaler was a Kansas State University engineering student in the early 1990s. As a student, he met a beautiful incoming freshman named Karen. Craig was instantly smitten with her. The two began to date, and eventually they became boyfriend and girlfriend. The couple were both ambitious and intelligent. They were a power couple. With graduation quickly approaching, Craig's academic merit earned him an offer from a prestigious engineering company in Colorado. He accepted, and he wooed Karen away from her family in Kansas. She was to go with him to Colorado. Within two years of being in Colorado, the couple married and they were pregnant with their first child, a little girl they would name Emily. By all outward appearances, the couple seemed crazy in love. Karen would tell all of her friends just how happy it made her to make her new husband happy. Those same friends would say Karen was the Martha Stewart of their group. Such a great homemaker. Karen popped out two more babies, another daughter, who the couple named Lauren, and a son named Sean. Karen would wait on her husband hand and foot like a good little wifey. And Craig, well, he was the king of his castle. In 1999, Craig would be offered a sweet job in Texas. Weatherford, Texas, actually. Weatherford is about a half an hour west of Fort Worth and an hour west of Dallas. Craig was being offered the position of utility director of the whole little city of almost 20,000 people. Craig was so excited. He packed up his wife, eight-year-old Emily, six-year-old Lauren, and newly born Sean. And the family traveled to Texas to begin their new life, a life where Craig was now an important city official. The home the Kaler family moved into was huge. It was a mansion, really. The Kaler family became quite well-loved in this small city, quite quickly. As Emily and Lauren grew into their teens and preteens, respectively, the eldest, Emily, started a band with family friends. It seemed her and her friends were inspired by the movie Josie and the Pussycats. Emily learned how to play drums, and she was getting very good at it. She could also sing. Her mom, Karen, was in her own family band when she grew up, so she was the band's biggest supporter. The band would practice several times a week in Karen's home office, and Karen would provide snacks and critiques for the young band. She even encouraged the band to allow younger sister Lauren to join. The two sisters were close, but they were so different from each other. The eldest, Emily, was much more quiet and reserved, while Lauren was kind of a wild child and she had an incredible sense of humor. Lauren was going to be a bass guitarist and also lend her vocals. At first, Lauren was just the comic relief because the bass guitar was a little bit bigger than she was. She soon grew into the guitar. The band called themselves Days Off. The band was invited to record at a studio, and they laid down five tracks for a demo. To anyone outside of this family looking in, the Kalers were a perfect family. They were the proverbial Jones family. You know the family everyone wants to keep up with? 
good kids, loving and doting wife and mother, and a hard-working father. The darkness that hovered behind closed doors was not seen. Karen was talking to her sister over the phone one day when Craig was at work. She told her sister that Craig had her on a rigid schedule in a tight budget. In spite of this family being rather wealthy and living in a mansion, Karen was allotted only so much money for groceries, and she had to produce receipts for everything. Even if she bought cereal and diapers, she had to show Craig the receipts. Karen was also expected to be in bed for sex every night by 8 p.m. After the sexual ritual, she had to be in bed next to Craig every night no later than 9 p.m. It was her set curfew. Sex had become just another chore on Karen's to-do list. There was no pleasure in it. There was no exhilaration or excitement to it. It was boring. But she complied to keep her man happy. Finally, unable to endure the confines of their marriage, the doing for everyone else in her life, Karen wanted to do one thing for herself. She decided a good way to gain some happiness back into her life and release her frustrations at home would be to join a gym. Craig said that there was no way he was going to pay for a gym membership for her. So Karen, being as creative as she was, she raised her own money by selling cakes she baked. Craig agreed to allow her to join a gym with her own money, as long as she was home in time to take care of the kids. And soon, Karen would become a member of Powerhouse Gym in Weatherford, Texas. Karen was so enthusiastic about her gym routines, she was quickly hired on as a fitness instructor. Karen was thriving off this new me time she was having. She was making new friends at Powerhouse, too. One of the new friends was an attractive fitness instructor named Sunny Reese. Side by side, Karen and Sunny were great instructors, and the bond of friendship between the women developed to an intimate level. Sunny provided love, tenderness, and kindness, just the things Karen didn't receive from her husband, Craig. Karen was falling in love with Sunny, and Sunny, too, was feeling the same for Karen. One evening, Karen broke the news to Craig that she was interested in a female instructor at the gym. Thinking Craig would throw a raged fit, Karen was surprised when Craig was supporting it. He thought it was a wonderful idea. Karen didn't realize that Craig was plotting his way into her new relationship. He was planning on this becoming a three-way sex play. He also told Karen to keep her relationship discreet with Sunny. He didn't think it was a good look for the family for Karen to be publicly open about her relationship with Sunny. More than likely, Craig didn't want to be embarrassed. He wasn't man enough for his wife. Neither Karen or Sunny had any intention on allowing Craig to be part of their relationship. Their relationship was not just based on sex. It was an emotionally connected relationship as well, something Craig didn't possess the aptitude to have. But that didn't stop Craig from trying on multiple occasions. He wholeheartedly wanted to conjure a threesome love fest between Karen and her new female lover, Sonny. He even sent bouquets of flowers to each Karen and Sonny and he texted both repeatedly about the threesome he was anticipating to occur. After Craig's many attempts at seducing a three-way sex encounter had been thwarted over and over again by the women, Craig began to spiral into desperation and jealousy. He started to apply for jobs in other states, somewhere far away from Sunny. He struck gold in June of 2008. He was offered a position at the Water and Light Department in Columbia, Missouri. Again, he packed up his family and he moved them. Karen and the kids were not happy about the move, as I'm sure you can imagine. As teenagers, the girls were being taken away from their band, their friends, and Sean was being taken away from his friends. Karen was upset having the kids being uprooted again. 
and she was angry about being taken away from Sonny. Begrudgingly, they all went with Craig to Missouri. Craig was certain this would end Karen and Sonny's little fling. He was wrong. Being as self-centered as he was, he couldn't see past himself that Karen and Sonny had strong bonds, bonds of mutual adoration for each other. Karen's daughters knew about Karen's relationship with Sonny, and they were there for it. They loved Sonny with their mom. Sonny made their mom happy. A long-distance relationship between Karen and Sonny continued through emails, phone calls, and an occasional visit when Craig was busy with work. On New Year's Eve 2008, almost six months after the family had been in Missouri, the Kaler family was invited back to Weatherford for a party. The party was to be at a family friend's home. Sonny was going to be there, too, because... Well, Karen invited her. No longer caring about hiding her relationship with Sonny, Karen and Sonny wandered off away from Craig. Some of the guests that night witnessed Karen and Sonny kissing. When Craig found out, he was mortified. He felt he had to defend his masculine honor, and he started to yell at Karen in front of the party guests. On their way out to the car in an attempt to straighten her up. Craig pushed Karen hard, causing her to fall to the ground and hit her head on the asphalt. After returning home to what was now Missouri, Karen filed for divorce. The start of 2009 was a crazy, angry, bitter one for the family that was once deemed to be perfect. Karen was sleeping on a twin bed now in another room. Craig was calling Karen's family members and trying to turn them against her by telling them that she was leaving him for a woman. By March, the couple's divorce attorneys were in arguments about child support, alimony, and any property they might own. Craig accused Karen of being a gold digger. In mid-March, Karen called the police on Craig. The police came out and arrested him on suspicions of domestic abuse. He left lasting bruises on Karen's arms. He claimed he was just trying to give her a big bear hug. Consent is everything, asshole. While Craig was in jail, Karen took the opportunity to get herself and the kids out of that house. She moved them into a little place of her own. After he got out of jail, Craig became extremely depressed. He took to stalking Karen. He wanted to know her every move. When allowed to see his kids, he only wanted to see Sean. He felt like Emily and Lauren had betrayed him by loving Sonny so much. Craig no longer gave a shit about anything that was once important to him, except maybe for Karen's life and his new inability to control her. Subsequently, he lost his new job because of it. With no family, no job, at the age of 48, Craig was forced to move back home with his parents in Topeka, Kansas. By November 2009, Thanksgiving weekend, 10-year-old Sean was spending time with his dad. Karen, 18-year-old Emily, 16-year-old Lauren, and even Sonny went to Karen's sister's home in Kansas for Thanksgiving dinner. The following day, Karen wanted her and the three kids to go and visit with her grandmother in Burlingame, Kansas for the day. Burlingame is just south of Topeka where Craig was living with his parents. Karen and the girls drove to Craig's parents' home to pick up Sean. And then they set off to see Karen's grandmother, 89-year-old Dorothy White. That November day began as a wonderful visit with the elderly grandmother. Dorothy was so happy to see her granddaughter Karen and her three great-grandchildren. Around 6 p.m., Karen and her son Sean were at the kitchen sink. They were washing some coins that they had found. Emily, Lauren, and the grandmother were in the living room. Suddenly, a man with a shotgun walked into the home through the kitchen door uninvited. He first shot Karen at the sink. Karen was shot in the leg and in her back. The bullet to her back fragmented. It struck her liver, stomach, and diaphragm. The bullets used were high caliber, high energy. 
they were meant to cause a lot of damage to whatever it might strike. Recognizing the man, Sean ran out the door for his life. He was able to get to a neighbor's home. The neighbor called 911 and kept Sean safe. <laughs> Emily was shot, standing in the living room. The bullet went through her breast and another through her back, striking her spinal cord and paralyzing her immediately. <laughs> Dorothy was shot once as she was sitting in her recliner. The bullet hit her arm, causing most of her elbow to implode. The shrapnel from the bullet continued into her abdomen, causing a large entry hole. Dorothy's life alert alarm was triggered at 6.07 p.m., possibly by the smoke from the shotgun after each fire. Lauren darted up the stairs as she saw the man with the gun. She yelled into the air for the life alert message system to hear. Somebody's in the house! He's trying to kill us! The intruder went up the stairs. Lauren was at the top of the stair landing, trying to run to a bedroom. She was shot in the back. The bullet destroyed her liver. Lauren was shot again this time in her buttocks with the fragmented bullet pieces ripping apart her intestines. Around 6.25 p.m., an Osage County deputy arrived to Dorothy White's home. He'd received two notifications for the same address and a possible shooting. One was a 911 call from a neighbor and another from Life Alert. The deputy could see Dorothy from the porch window. He cautiously entered the home. He saw Karen lying in the kitchen area. He then heard crying and pleas for help coming from upstairs. The deputy went upstairs and he found Lauren. He stayed with her until the EMTs arrived. Lauren told the deputy she'd been shot twice. He asked her, Who did this to you? And she said, My dad, please don't let me die. I don't want to die. Please help me. The deputy did the only thing he could, and he assured the young girl that an ambulance was coming to get her to the hospital. The eldest daughter, Emily, was the only one who died in the house that evening. Karen, Dorothy, and Lauren were all taken to the hospital. Karen and Lauren would succumb to their injuries in the hospital that night, and Dorothy would die in the hospital four days later but not before naming the shooter to as many people as she could. The man who came into her house and opened fire on all of them was Craig Kaler. A manhunt was underway for Craig. He was found 13 hours after the shooting wandering a road. He was disheveled and looked lost as the Kansas Bureau of Investigation picked him up. More ammunition was found in Craig's car and an unused prescription for an anti-anxiety medicine was also found. DNA belonging to Craig was found all over Dorothy's home. Craig was being charged with the capital murder of his wife Karen, their two daughters Emily and Lauren, and Karen's grandmother Dorothy. In Craig's preliminary hearing, he entered a plea of insanity. He claimed Karen's lesbian relationship with Sonny is what made him snap and do what he did. Yeah, the same relationship that he was encouraging because he thought he was going to get a threesome out of it? Yeah, that one. His defense also claimed that his wife's affair accompanied with the divorce, him losing his job, him not taking his anti-anxiety medicine, because apparently he's not an adult and can't take his own fucking medicine him having erratic behavior, and not covering the crime up proves that Craig wasn't in his right mind and that the murders were not premeditated. A psychiatrist on behalf of the defense claimed that Craig suffered from depression, narcissism, and histrionic disorder. The prosecution hit back that Craig had the presence of mind to spare himself and his son. He was vindictive, not insane. Craig was also a talented hunter. He had access to guns, and he went into Dorothy's house, fired seven shots, and each shot hit its mark. Craig was simply a cold-blooded murderer. 
the prosecution also had an expert psychiatrist witness who agreed that, yes, while Craig is clinically depressed, he was still of sound enough mind to plan the murders he committed. In my opinion, what set Craig off the deep end wasn't his wife having an intimate relationship with a woman. What set him into this manic break was that he no longer could control Karen. A woman he had controlled for so many years was no longer his cook, his maid, his sex slave. She was now her own woman and happy without him. And that's what took Craig over the edge. Thank you, Dr. CJ. Why, you're welcome, Rainbow Warriors. The court ruled against allowing Craig to make an insanity plea, as the state of Kansas abolished the insanity defense in 1995. So Craig had to face the music at his trial. Sean, Karen and Craig's son, was the prosecution's star witness. Now at the age of 12, he testified to watching his dad shoot his mother in front of him. Craig was found guilty on all counts he was charged with by a jury of his peers. At his sentencing, Craig was smug and sarcastic at every chance he got. Even when he was sentenced to death, as a parting shot when he left the courtroom, he shouted to his parents, Take care of Sean so he's not raised by a bunch of freaks. This dig was intended to further cause pain to Karen's family. Craig's defense attorney took his trial to the Supreme Court on the grounds the state of Kansas would not entertain Craig's insanity plea. They stated Craig at the time didn't morally know right from wrong. However, Craig's case was shot down again by the big boy court, stating basically, Kansas can make whatever law either for or against the insanity plea that they want, and in 1995, they chose to abolish it, and that ruling stands. As does Craig's death sentence. Yeah, do you guys get that? His defense team said that Craig didn't know morally right from wrong. He's fucking 48 years old, supposedly intelligent. He's not a six-year-old. He's a grown-up who should have taken his medication if he needed it. While Kansas still practices the death penalty, they're very rusty at it. They haven't executed anyone since 1965. So Craig Kaler sits on death row. Which is also stupid because Kansas doesn't really have a death row. And if they did, there's only eight men on it. Two are brothers who killed five people. Another is a man on death row for raping and murdering a woman in 1996. Another man is convicted of murdering three women. Another murdered a couple in 2004. One killed a sheriff in 2007. Another killed a 19-year-old female college student also in 2007. And then there's Craig. Kansas almost went through with an execution in January of this year. They almost execute a woman who was found guilty of murdering a pregnant woman and cutting the baby from the pregnant woman's womb. And then she tried to pass the baby off as her own. A stay of execution was granted for the killer. I know a lot of people are against the death penalty, but I feel for some cases it's necessary. There's some killers there is no denying they committed the crime. And for many of them, there'll be no reform in their behavior. Our prisons aren't set up to really give reform, and they should be. But it makes it unsafe for us to let these fuckers out. Why shouldn't their lives be removed as they removed others' lives? Can you imagine Craig's daughter, Lauren, and how terrified she must have seen that it was her father there to kill her? I just can't imagine what that poor little girl went through in her final moments. I think the state of Kansas needs to give the juice of death to Craig. And that's just my two cents. This episode's quickie, a crime quickie, comes to us from Denneby, Maine, South Yorkshire, England. 51-year-old Jerry Apicello was a gay man who chose to live his life as a recluse. He just didn't want to be bothered by anyone. Jerry also had an addiction to alcohol. Again, a coping mechanism that's not healthy for us. 
It's said by some who knew him, his alcoholism is the true reason he became a loner. Jerry was a small business owner. December 3rd, 2019, Jerry took a quick trip to a convenience store. He was there to buy some booze. As he left the store and headed back home, four young men followed him down an alleyway. Soon they chased him, and when they caught up to him, they began to beat him, hit him with bricks, one hit him with a metal rod, and they stomped on his head. The men called Jerry names like faggot and nonce. I had to look up nonce, and I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. The Collins Dictionary told me a nonce is Britain's slang for pedophile. Once the attack ended, a woman who saw the tail end of the attack went to help Jerry. She helped him get home and into his apartment. I thought it was kind of weird and even a little culpable that this woman didn't call the police immediately. Who doesn't have a cell phone in 2019? Two weeks later, family members began to worry about Jerry when they hadn't heard from him. His family called the police to have a welfare check conducted on Jerry. When the police arrived, they went into Jerry's apartment and they found he was dead. Jerry had died from 28 blows to his head the night he was beaten. CCTV footage revealed Jerry's attackers. Three men in their 20s and a 15-year-old boy were arrested. There were two other news articles about Jerry's attack, and they stated three girls and a teenager were arrested for Jerry's murder. I'm wondering if they did that because the guys who actually did the crime, they kind of have non-traditional gender, non-specific names. The guys arrested are 20-year-old Shay Nicholson, 20-year-old Kean Gerard, and 24-year-old Martel Brown. Because of his age, the teen's name was not published. Shay and Martel were convicted of manslaughter. They were sentenced to life with a minimum of 15 years. The teenager was also convicted of manslaughter, but only sentenced to 30 months. And he was immediately released after the trial because he had already been sitting in jail for 30 months. No word if Kean Gerard, the other named attacker, was even held after his arrest. And that's about all I could find on Jerry's case. A rainbow crime that received very little unicorn justice. Love you, Rainbow Warriors. And remember, it's not a crime to be gay. Unless you're a murderer. <laughs> <laughs>